design. And this is a, a framework that has uh, come out of a challenge that we got from Big Sevason and Andreas Vettere to look into how to design a implementation framework for systems oriented design. Um, I will present uh, what is the first version of our um, framework. We will have a look at the details a bit later. I think it's okay to that we go into some key principles uh, and topics first. So if we look at systems oriented design, it's a methodology and a design practice that is especially uh, aimed or geared at understanding and working with complex systems, according to Birgir. And, and systems oriented design, of course, includes design and implementation of interventions that is aimed at creating change. Uh, and implementation is a process that has to navigate ambiguity, balance multiple factors, such as time, perspectives, resources, scales within the current and the future state of the system. So in systemic design, sorry, in systemic change, there might not be a definitive um, state uh, for the end of the implementation. There will always be uh, things that has to be picked up and, and looked further at, or it could be changes that's necessary. Uh, which means that uh, observing and supporting outcomes is important. And in our framework, we have looked into to how to do this. So SODIF, as we call it, provides a framework for the implementation process with a def defined, with defined pathways and key elements to consider along those pathways. So as you navigate, you'll find uh, key elements to consider, and but also the actual pathway in relation to the elements is, is a part of the consideration. So SODIF is about the journey of designing and iterating on implementation strategies rather than uh, reaching an end point from us in a linear way. Um, by, for example, implementing a specific design solution. It's about the actual pathways and, and how they could be used to guide that implementation and then work further on it. So, so, if also, so the framework identifies also a need, uh, a set of roles that is needed, or at, at least what we saw as uh, beneficial to have within this process of implementation. It can be that one person takes on multiple roles or but it can be a whole team that has multiple roles. But we see that someone has to be uh, the, the person to open doors, cross boundaries. Someone has to be the designers. Someone should be a good in facilitation. There might be the need for, for someone to tell the story, uh, think in systems and systems uh, theory, for example. And there is also someone has, has to have a, an idea about uh, resources uh, or management of resources, which of course all of these uh, things impact implementation. I did or we did uh, include uh, a bit into the design process just to give you a sort of a reflection on, on the thought process for our part. Yeah, it started actually from from working on the creative process framework in, in uh, systems oriented design and then shifting towards looking at implementations. And we tried to see that from multiple perspectives. And we, we went through theory to look there and we also had reflections on own experience. We are a team that's uh, experienced with, with many years of, of working uh, experience. And we took that further into design, trying very hard to move away from linear approaches, which is something that tends to dominate some of these implementation frameworks. And we looked uh, it, at it through facilitation, through the roles, uh, at what sort of barriers and limits uh, occur. And we started to more, move towards a circular pathway sort of approach. And then inspired by uh, something organic like cells, we, we started to see these pathways emerge and then working further on that based on both experience and, and theory, we, we started to, to draw up this framework and describe it. And also these roles emerged because of the pathways and, and the relations between the elements. So if we end up at the implementation framework itself, the idea is not to go from left to right, but sort of come in and rethink what you have in your proposition. Do you have to clarify ambiguity, for example? Is there an iteration needed? Do you need to adjust something? Is it something that has to be adopted? And then if you want to go into the actions necessary, do you have an idea on what it is ought to be, uh, what the intervention is about? How are you going to approach it? 
what are the resources, the stakeholders involved, what is the time and plan, how is the communication going to take place. And you can see that there might be changes needed and you might, for example, have to go into reflection and check back with the original proposition, perhaps even back to the, the creative process, validate something, uh, establish new boundaries yeah. for the implementation, or perhaps go for the first implementation and see what happens, support it, develop it, react on things that happens and, and feed that back into the framework. So as indicated with this sort of white dot, uh, the facilitation is a key thing here to take the team mentally and sort of process wise through this framework as you work on complex issues and use it as a, a framework to, to do so. And of course the different roles have different um, effects on or so, so on facilitation here. So there is no, no one leader all the way that can change uh, between um, who's facilitating what in, the, in relation to what's going on within the framework. Um, how am I doing on time, by the way? Because uh, we can go into a bit more details, but. Um, I guess you can just quickly wrap up, John. I spend, uh... Sorry, just to wrap up here. Yeah, can, yeah, just quickly wrap up if you have um, something to say, Bon. Um, yeah, just as we saw, I said, um, there is, um, not on definitive end state. I think that's sort of a, pro, uh, a thing to, to think about here that implementations just don't end by following a liner path and then you're finished. There's often uh, the need to go through some of these pathways and, and work on these to succeed with implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Espen. Uh, I was just thinking about uh, how different it would be from the double diamond process of um, reflecting proposition and action and implementation. Probably we could discuss it with Jonathan at the, um, well, uh, we are done with the presentation. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, Espen. Um, and I would like to call UNG, um, who would be presenting with value mapping for stakeholders engagement. Hello, my name is UNG Park, an executive director at Indeed Innovation. We are a innovation consultancy focused on circularity. We're based in Germany. So uh, today I'm gonna start by giving you a brief uh, introduction or overview of the project background and then go into the process of mapping this topic. So this project was commissioned by Adapa Group, which is a European packaging manufacturer uh, based in Austria and they wanted to co-develop a business case for product traceability through enabling what's called digital product passport. I'm not going to go into this topic, which is really growing topic in this industry, but this was a technology enabler for them to innovate in the packaging business. But to start, they were recognizing the plastic waste and part of the big plastic waste origin was from packaging, which they are responsible for. And uh, European regulation is focusing on this topic uh, more and more and the law is coming. And that was initial motivation, but then client instantly think, thought about maybe not just compliance reasons, but they want to sort of future proof um, their innovation. So one of the initial framing of the topic was looking at the plastic waste in a different manner. What if the plastic waste was, or packaging waste was a, a resource that should be retrieved and it's a, a value for the business and everybody uh, uh, in the value chain. So with that, we were looking at packaging as a part of the solution with the client and thinking about what technology can be deployed as well as what systems do we need to invest, investigate. And that was one part of this mapping exercise. And I mentioned this word uh, briefly before, this was the technology enabler that client was trying to implement but then what they were missing was this stakeholder perspective and they were lacking this systematic view of their business. And part of their business concept they started with was creating this uh, digital ecosystem. So this was a big leap for them as a packaging manufacturer. And one of the packagings they, they make is Haribo. You probably know this gummy bear packaging. Um, 
and they were merely a supplier or manufacturer of the plastic packaging. However, they knew that to comply to coming uh, emerging law, as well as really looking at the future of how do we mitigate the waste generated from us and also still delivering the value of the packaging, which is protecting the product itself. Uh, they needed to instantly work with this broad network of the, the partners, which are you know, traditionally competitors. Sometimes they don't really look at it in a traditional sense, but in the new circular economy lens, all of a sudden they need these partners to work together to achieve the goal. So to get there, we did three things as a main exercise or activities. And also this was very repetitive and irritative exercise that really fed the map and also sort of like we gained the story out of the mapping. So there was the big loop going um, in circles throughout the project. And it started with the stakeholder identification, uh, started with the client's network that was existing. So we were looking left and right, their value chain, um, the suppliers of the packaging materials to printers, to retailers who's putting these products in the market and then users and so on and so forth. And then we also added our secondary research to identify who's in the value chain of the packaging materials. And from then on, we did the, the, the qualitative interviews. And there were four framing questions that led to structuring the map and designing the map, which was um, mainly four things. What is the main activity or need that triggers the, the first occasion of a process? Who and what is involved in this activity? And what are the interdependencies and inter interrelations? Who is doing what in what order? What is needed, what kind of knowledge or data is needed for this, and also what context purpose is created to coordinate the process and systems. So we started with somewhat very kind of crude flowchart like things with the players, stakeholders identified from the initial research. And then that sort of got more formulated in the linear fashion of defining the main stages or steps. And then we start layering the activities and more stakeholders, primary, secondaries, and so on. And then this, at this point, we involve the stakeholders internally in the beginning with the client team to one, confirm the, the, the accuracy and see if there's any gaps in our, our overview. Then later on, we involved external uh, stakeholders. If the business case were to be real, the potential partners in their network was the, the reviewer and they gave a lot of feedback for us to get to this point. And at this point, we were looking at what kind of story that we can convey in this map and then thought about the right design, um, information hierarchy and so on to uh, uh, really tell the story of what could be done in the packaging value chain and what kind of value that can be recreated for all stakeholders involved. So I would just wrap it there. Thank you, Angie. Uh, I would really like to uh, know more about the digital product passports and how it's evolving and unfolding back in Europe and what major significance does it play in complexity of uh, packaging industry. Um, thank you once again. And I'd like to call Sally Tros Malma. Um, who will be presenting Social Ecological Corridors in Monterey. Yes, Ali, we can see your screen. And you yeah, I was that. muted. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, uh, we want to present uh, this uh, collective project uh, called uh, Meeting Mountains, Social Ecological Corridors in Monterey. So we want to uh, uh, explain that this project raises from the challenge letting trees uh, situations. One is the climate crisis, uh, then the, the loss of biodiversity and also the fragmentation of habitats caused by human activities. So in this sense, uh, we want to value nature, considering uh, mountains as an opportunity to bring the ecological connectivity, the reintegration of nature with people through the interscalar networks. Um, by doing that, uh, we studied the morph morphology uh, of ecological corridors uh, to apply the socio-ecological concept. Um, 
This approach focuses on how ecosystems help to cope with external uh, conditions through the services they provide and the benefits they provide to communities. Um, the scheme also considers that ecosystems are influenced by boundary conditions, such as climatic trends, public policies related to natural resources, and socioecological environments of the communities. And we wanted to mention that for looking into opportunities, we didn't only just uh, went to the online data, but we also went on site. And uh, also to do doing collective walks with people from the community to get knowledge and understand this, the variables of the system and the opportunities for socio-ecological uh, connect, connectivity uh, between the mountains and the city and the different corridors. And then we also map these uh, down into uh, collective maps uh, that help us to... to and speaking about the project, uh, Tejiendo Montañas, the intentions of the project are focused on ensuring the right to nature to the entire population. This process is divided into three phases, identify, connect, and renaturalize or rewilding. And in the first phase of uh, identifying, we point out uh, topography because in Monterrey, there is no relation uh, within the city. Then the protected natural areas in order to guarantee the right to nature to the entire population. Then the water ne network in order to identify these water currents and heal them up. Then the areas that tend to be floated uh, compared to the urbanization in order to have this look um, into uh, the areas that tend to be affected during during these uh, rains. Uh, and um this in order to um, identify these current areas that are are affected but in order there are like this rewilding potential and in the second phase with the purpose of connecting we identify existing green areas uh, common spaces schools and disuse land as a possible actors in order to include this in these socio-ecological corridors and with this educational program that complements uh, these lines with corridors. And in the third phase, we are identifying um, industry as a potential actor and thinking about public policies in order to, the, with the industry, to play a more responsible and caring role in the city. And now we are seeing how these uh, socio-ecological corridors uh, are like a drawing, connecting all these important dots uh, that help us with these potential actors. And this is a look in a metropolitan scale with these all these rivers that are currently in the city. And then this is like a more urban scale with this uh, urban node that, that we did an implementation case. So lastly, we looked into like how these spaces could be already with an intervention on, on, the, on the space. And also we were looking into the different ecosystems that are in, in, in this area of the metropolitan area of Monterey. And yeah, so we looked into the productive shrublands, pollination gardens, but also plot zones, and how also the ravines can, can be um, opened again and, and be also part of this connectivity. And so this is just like a side view of a public school, and then we can look into this another uh, image of the school that has already this uh, implementation of this socio-ecological um, equipment. And if you can go on, Sally, with the other uh, different, with the different uh, visualizations. So this is like a park, this is a ravine, that is a socio-ecological uh, socio corridor. And these are just like visualizations on how these interventions could, could look in, in the place. Thank you, Sally. Uh, well, um, oh, go ahead, Sally. Oh, sorry. And uh, just to uh, to close uh, with the final idea, the 
Tejiendo Montañas uh, wants to raise this uh, integration with people and nature uh, through sociopolitical uh, interventions, um, programs, uh, by evolving them. No? So it's important for this in the process, uh, citizen participation. Thank you. Thank you once again, Sati and team. Uh, I would like to call Davin, uh, who would be speaking about ecotones, tensions, innovation, and systemic changes. Um, and today I'm going to talk about ecotones. So for this particular uh, um, talk, I want to uh, get everybody to focus on three aspects of this idea. The first one is probably going to be more central uh, according to this uh, idea of ecotone, is that not all pain points are of the same types. So, you know, there are, you know, uh, pain points that are uh, emerged because of um, misalignments of uh, people's different expectations, different actors' expectations, for example. But the one that uh, I want us to focus on is the uh, contradiction in principles that causes those pain points. So this is the first aspect. The second aspect is that uh, this uh, ecotone is grounded on the philosophy of critical realism. And um, the and then you know that's kind of a, the foundation of my uh, philosophical approach to design as well. Uh, but essentially what it is, uh, in, in a very <laughs> simplified uh, manner, uh, it's taking from kind of like uh, pushing from Kant's uh, uh, transcendental question about how is this possible? How is that possible? Uh, very much focus on uh, people's uh, structure uh, of the mind. Uh, what critical realists are try trying to uh, push for is to include the ecosystem, the world, right? By asking what the world has to be like in order for you know this and that to be possible. So, so this is the second aspect, the uh, philosophical foundation. The third one would be uh, uh, taking cue from uh, inspiration from the uh, environmental sciences on ecotones, uh, basically the overlapping of two uh, different uh, uh, ecosystems um, that create uh, this kind of like boundaries called ecotone. And a lot of design, uh, I think, that uh, have taken the ecotone inspiration too. For example, uh, Pendel and Julian in architecture talking about how different disciplines come together and uh, you know create new disciplines. You know what's called the boundary effects and so forth. Um, but what I am interested in to tie back to pain points is to look at what kind of tensions emerge from these ecotones, right? So what about ecotone in surface design? So uh, um, think about uh, Bhaskar's uh, critical realism that I was mentioning before. We want to include the world, not just the individual. So which means as soon as two different actors interact, they create, you know, their space becomes an ecotone because they themselves have the ecosystems, the world that they bring with them uh, that influence their motivations, their goals, uh, their behaviors, and so on and so forth. And by uh, investigating when there are tensions happen, when there are pain points that uh, either actors are experiencing, the purpose of mapping this ecotone is try to look at how the structure of their world are contributing to those tensions. And uh, uh, when we find out that, uh, you know, some of these uh, 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 structures in the ecosystems, for example, it could be rules, regulations, corporate goals, and so forth, directly contribute to the tension that arises, that is a contradiction in principle. Um, let's see. So this is just an example of the uh, work uh, uh, that uh, I did in the past about like caregivers and uh, their clients' interactions. As you can see, you know, um, when we look at just their interactions, the experience, you know, whether you know providing extra hours or receiving extra hours from the caregivers, 
it seems like there are some uh, internal um, human experience uh, 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 that causes some of these uh, um, tensions, right? But when we zoom out and include the ecosystems, then we realize that, oh, there's specific legal, re legal responsibilities that's outlined by the state. And then from the client's perspective, oh, the hours are assessed by the state as well, right? So here we can see how you know the structure are directly contributing to their uh, um, um, uh, pain points. So the idea here, uh, using uh, ecotones as a map, and then using the uh, um, uh, critical realist approach to uh, find the uh, pain points uh, where it's contradiction in principle. We want to move from asking questions like, how do we improve efficiency? How can we help people manage stress? How can we help people manage their finances into a more structural and systemic problem? You know, how does this structure define efficiency? You know, why is it defined this way anyway, right? What structural issues that contribute to people's stress? You know, why are people so you paid so poorly? Uh, in this uh, system, you know what are what are the structure that causes that? Uh, uh, you know what Bhaskar called causal mechanisms. But um, going back to surface design, we can use this framework to uh, say contribute to you know the ecosystem mapping, for example, where usually we have horizons uh, in in layered horizon. But now we can add kind of what's the foundation for the structural change that could help that. Um, so to uh, sum up, um, you know, keep thinking about uh, using this uh, ecotone framework to think about what the structure of the world is like, because uh, human behaviors, uh, you know, uh, are uh, advocated by their most motivational incentives. And beyond that, there's kind of like organizational rules that influence them, and then their social structure, this political economic system, and so forth. So the idea is not just thinking about uh, using this ego term to think about like whys, but we have to think about whys in a deliberate and stratified manner. So that's 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 me. <laughs> um, a bit past time. Sorry about that. Thank you, Darwin. Uh, it's an interesting um, topic for me as well. Um, thinking about critical realism and how critical realism would provide a uh, transitional space. Uh, so as to break the uh, the institutional logics or the organizational structure or provide a space where uh, it could be efficient in a way. Thank you once again. I would call, like to call Jonathan. Um, Jonathan would help us um, provide his valuable comments and thus we can uh, start with a dialogue probably amongst us. And if you have any questions, uh, just raise your hand and go ahead. Thanks, uh, Akash. Uh, and thank you all for uh, <clears throat> wonderful uh, presentations, I think. You know, being this uh, mapping Monday, it illustrates the power of uh, of mapping uh, and the way they are the and the breadth of of how one can use mapping in all kinds of different uh, areas and trajectories. So, I really find the uh, uh, those maps or these cases and maps that you have presented uh, very interesting and. Uh, and thought provoking. So, uh, I, I would first I would like to kind of address the maps uh, specifically with some remarks. So first, of, I'll go with kind of sequential the way they were presented today. So, uh, so for the group working with the with the SODIF uh, implementation framework, I really think that. So first of all, thank you for this both well informed and I think it's this uh, wonderful combined uh, map of uh, both sequential and uh, circular gigamap at the same time that somehow tries to illustrate these pathways of navigating complex implementation processes. And uh, I find it extremely interesting. And I love the dynamics of the feedback loops that have, that have been annotated onto the map, uh, trying to capture these, uh, these uh, mechanisms that goes on uh, in, in such uh, processes. So, and I think it's great that these kinds of framework emerges from the executive master course at AHU. So it's super nice. Uh, 
But I guess my main my main uh, question regarding this this part, and we can maybe turn back to it, is what was the purpose of this framework? Is kind of, is this a, is this a framework that is uh, intended to lay out a conceptual framework of the phenomenon itself, or is it more like a a, a guide for practicing systems oriented designers of what things they may have to you know take into consideration? So. Kind of how how do you imagine this framework being useful? I mean, a part of uh, a learning uh, in a learning environment, in a sense. So, so that would be my my kind of triggering question to you. However, uh, so I don't know if if we should open for for some comments now, or I should just uh, maybe I should just make some comments in general, and then we can go back to some of these questions. So please note that down. Uh, so the second uh, presented model was the value mapping stakeholder engagement uh, 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 map. And again, I think this is this is also kind of illustrating a, a circular or, or a sequential, although circular uh, kind of gigamap. Uh, and it's very clear and easy to read. So I really think you managed to uh, capture a rather complex phenomenon involving many different fa factors into a very clear and accessible map, actually. So that I would really... Thank you for uh, for for making that information available in such a, in such an accessible way. Uh, and I perceive it. This is kind of an illustration of material stocks and flows that goes in and out to the system, uh, and, and and it involves also the points main points of interest related to that. So so I guess my main my main question or or, or research is: Could you say more about uh, both the trajectories leading out? I see that there's. There's, there's some stocks coming in and then there's some trajectories leading out and would like to hear more about that and their you know what's the scale of those uh, in terms of the graphical uh, emphasis that you put on that so I think it's also important to to figure out what are these things that goes out of this uh, giant loop and the other thing is maybe more about the the, the lanes of the circularity what informed your uh, your decision to for instance put the uh, product data and then logistics and then sales uh, and, and and those lanes and and some of them are highlighted more than others so I would also like to uh, hear a bit more about that uh, and maybe in our discussion later on um then jumping into the to the to the monetary metropolitan area process that was presented afterwards, uh, I think it, it always, it's very powerful to have contextual maps that actually map out a certain context, uh, because again, it, it it makes it very easy to access and, and to follow because we are quite known with this kind of uh, uh, type of map uh, to to orient ourselves within. Uh, and I think the idea of applying the lenses of uh, uh, of, or trying to kind of uh, approach uh, a, con a context with the with the lenses of social ecological uh, pathways or or let's say corridors is very powerful and promising. So I think that's very very nice that you've uh, done it this way. And I think that but but then I, I mean I was looking at those maps uh, as they were depicted on the map, and I was trying to translate some of the of the, of the things you've written about it. And I think that when when you also show the meso uh, perspectives of some of the ideas you have for interventions and, and 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 things like that, it really became much more alive and clear. So so I think that was very useful to also uh, see some of the of the more meso and maybe I, I mean I would go also into the micro maybe, but 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 combining this macro perspective and the meso perspective, I think makes it much more readable of what you're trying to actually achieve with this mapping. So I'm curious to hear a little bit about uh, 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 whether you have uh, thought about including those meso perspectives into the map somehow and integrating into one single composition, because then that would strengthen, I think, your map. So how to do these uh, compositions of both uh, macro perspective corridors like a bird eye perspective but then also going into the maybe meso and micro perspective on that same map in a sense so that's kind of my challenge to you a bit uh, would like to hear your thoughts about that uh, and and when it comes to the, the the last map i was i was really really i think it was really interesting to see uh, to approach uh, mapping from this econote uh, perspective 
Um, I find it very, uh, I mean, I define this as relational mapping somehow. So these are two ecosystems that are relating to one another or overlapping one another. And it's in this relational uh, um, dialogic or inter interactions that, 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 that I find this map very interesting uh, to approach. Uh, <clears throat> but I think, uh, but I think that, uh, that, uh, um, so there, 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 this, I mean, how, I, I, and, I, and one thing that I find I mean, particularly interesting in this map is that it combines both the emotional and the functional aspects involved. So you have like the functional and the, and, and the emotional aspect. And I was curious to hear more about how should one approach mapping these emotions involved in, in each of those two, let's say, ecosystems uh, uh, that somehow needs to negotiate or, or, or that kind of suddenly find themselves uh, overlapping each other. So I'm particularly interested in this emotional uh, aspect because I think we have a tendency as, uh, as systemic designers to, to overload uh, uh, the, 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 the functional part, the, 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 the technocratic part uh, into those equations. So I'm interested to hear your thoughts about that. And also maybe uh, a bit about the speculations regarding the emergent behaviors that we were also touching upon with the different horizons that may be unpacked in this in this uh, intermediate space between those two ecosystems so so i guess that's kind of some 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 both remarks and some questions to you that to spark off the the conversation maybe so i don't know if any of you has some some comments or some some sharing of thoughts that you would like to respond to some of my questions or provocations uh, please raise your hand if you have any inputs or if you can help me to learn more <laughs> Well, I can start. Thank you for the comment, Jonathan. I'm going to start with your first question. How, I think maybe paraphrasing, I heard that how is it being used and how did we envision being used? It was for visioning, uh, I would say in one word. So we wanted to reimagine the current linear plastic uh, packaging value chain. Um, and this was a in a way, paradigm shift for the manufacturers like them. So it was very critical to establish that uh, from the get-go. So from linear supply chain thinking to circular value chain or value network thinking was very important. So if you guys recall the map progression, it was very linear format. And this was very important for us to accurately represent the current status quo. But then soon we realized that wasn't really that useful for our client and what they wanted to do within the value chain. It was more for what it could be. So future visioning was the goal. Therefore, we made a map sort of loop and connect and that was very important uh, aspect to designing it later on second question uh, i think uh, second third i think you kind of uh, mentioned about data representation and what was the what was the decision making of different layers or different components and this was again with the idea of what this map is functioned for the client in their storytelling, their, their visioning within their organization, as well as with the external partners, the, the map has to serve very clear view on what they can achieve together. So we quickly understood the priorities, what which excerpts should be uh, highlighted and what layer, for example, logistics, we learned that initially in the map, it was one of the value chain component in the block, but then we put it out in the background because uh, many stakeholders that we interviewed said, say that's completely different industry. They have their own thing going on and so on. So I think this really led to creating this final version. Thank you. I think that's a good remark. So to make the stakeholders able to see themselves as part of the map is some of those things who guides our decisions of how to yeah, uh, lay out different kinds of information. It's a very good answer. Any other comments or anybody wants to respond to my maybe interpretations? Yes, Espen. Yes, I could just uh, revert back to you asking who is uh, our framework designed for and who is going to use it. 
and uh, I'll include also a question that Peter had in the chat. Have you tested this? And, uh, and say something about that. So first of all, uh, we we designed SODIF for those who, or for SODIF, sorry, system-oriented designers and those who are part of system-oriented design projects as, an, as a framework for, for reflection and navigation in terms of, of working with interventions. So you have sort of an idea that you have to have some knowledge about systems-oriented design or be part of it at least with, with someone who has. In terms of uh, uh, usage, uh, I have tested it in a real project with a real client as a way to go but from SIP analysis to impact and threshold analysis for planning the, and, and designing in, interventions to make them reflect on what we should include as criteria, but who is also going to take charge or be in response, uh, be responsible for for the different parts that we are discussing within uh, this context and and what we are going to do, uh, and also relate that to time and effort. I can't say it's too much about the details, unfortunately. That would be great, but uh, that was sort of the first attempt to, to use it, and then we use it as a reflective framework, as more than more than. Uh, I think uh, quite practical. It, we just talked a lot about the different aspects and then used that discussion to formulate the impact and threshold analysis and the, the further work. So that's sort of the first practical test from my part. And I think Ingrid, you can say something about it from, from the Dolga side. Yes, I think it's worth pointing out that, uh, that the um, uh, SODIF team all came at it from a very practical... Um, can you hear me? Okay, uh, we came at it from a very practical uh, angle. We're all practitioners and we are looking for tools to use in our uh, practical work uh, as architects and designers. If we are not implementing ourselves, we are uh, advising people in implementation processes. And so this is a very, it's, it's a very useful summary to introduce certain concepts into an otherwise extremely, often extremely linear uh, progression of things. So uh, this is the way that we have used it uh, in Dorga as well, where I'm um, uh, um, developing, uh, a, let's say, a challenge to the construction industry, which is like the mother of all linear processes, um, uh, the construction of um, a building with all its risks and all its um, and all its uh, costs. So uh, that just to be able in a structured and um, and uh, theoretically well argued way to introduce loops into those processes have been very useful i think in uh, in a lot of our um day to day practical work thank you i i really think that's uh, very interesting and uh, but but still i think you are maintaining some kind of sequential core here uh you know uh, proposition action implementation uh, uh why do you choose to still keep those uh separated from one another it's just uh, to follow up your question is that to kind of we cannot the... change the direction of time uh, jonathan yeah. no i know <laughs> and, and the, the sequence of action the sequence of human action um and so uh, uh i think wh while we were discussing this obviously this was done in the the question of our, uh, in the context of our master's course when we were doing it the main element uh, that was new to us was really the introduction of the proposition, uh, not as a plan of action, but as a possibility that you kept coming back to, so that instead of closing down opportunities, you are, with every iteration, keeping them open. So that, and I think you still need to somehow keep those uh, chickens uh, separated uh, in order to, for also for other people to follow the, uh, the discussion. Yeah, and also the, the one earlier version had the arrows pointing both ways, so you could actually come from implementation and go through the, the framework to make a propo uh, proposition. So we had discussions about this because of what you're bringing up, the sort of linearity of, of those three uh, proposition action and implementation. So that sort of that arrow alone sort of is something that we have to look further into, perhaps. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll, I'll uh, uh, make some remark to answer uh, your question, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Uh, so the easier, uh, there, there are two aspects uh, that, that you asked. One is about the emergent uh, behavior. And then secondly, is about the emotional aspect. They're related, but I can start with the emergent behavior first. 
So from the work, uh, from my past work, uh, when we are looking at the uh, interactions, uh, when we kind of like met uh, um, the uh, two ecosystems together. So what tends to happen, uh, at least I could cite like, uh, uh, you know, at least two different projects that uh, I observe, I start to observe when I think about it this way, is that um, precisely because people human beings are not constrained by their institutional functions. Their human nature always bleeds out, right? Like a nurse is not just a nurse, a, a caregiver is not just caregivers. Um, there are aspects of uh, care, uh, compassion, and so forth that are not um, exactly aligned to their uh, structural functions. And because of that, emergent behavior uh, happen in that they try to uh, hack or work around their institutional uh, functions in order to address the needs of their service re recipients, for example. And what's really interesting is in the case of caregivers and nurses is that even though they don't uh, uh, network together. Even if you know these uh, caregivers or nurses are in the opposite sides of the country, when they encounter the same problem, uh, because you know human nature. I don't want to go too deeply about this. We cannot define it. That there's like a shared uh, disposition of all of us. The emergent behavior are very similar, and that's why in the map it's very useful to take that into a uh, 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 part of the uh, uh, evolution mapping, for example. Could this be a new capabilities? Because people across the world, you know, do this, you know, it's almost kind of like synchronicity without having to communicate with each other, right? So that part is really interesting. So thank you for catching that. Uh, the second really related part is the emotional aspect. The emotion is hugely important to be mapped in the uh, uh, um, uh, the ecotones, uh, precisely because, as I mentioned, that humans are not just defined by their institutional functions. My job, like my, the work that I do at an organization is defined by my job description, right? Uh, but obviously we are all more than kind of like just what we do from nine to five. Um, in critical realist theory, and I try to adapt this to the ecosystem, uh, is that there are three uh, domains of reality. It's a very stratified uh, uh, analysis of what reality is. So there's a, a domain of the uh, empirical, the actual, and the real. So in the ecotone, the emotional aspect is what kind of like uh, uh, drives uh, what happened on the uh, uh, em empirical level. So that needs to be explicitly mentioned and explain kind of like what are uh, in the dom domain of the real, what are the causal mechanism that causes those emotional uh, 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 aspects to emerge. So uh, I hope that answer your question. <laughs> thank you. I wonder if we have a few. Yeah, thank you. That was very interesting. Yeah. And, and important as well. I really like that you added that uh, aspect into the mapping uh, template. So it's very interesting. Uh, I wonder if we have some minutes to visit the the map of uh, of the Monterey metropolitan area. Do you have any comments to? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Jonathan, for your comments. And um, and yeah, of course. Also here, uh, Peter put on the chat that. It should be like also really interesting to look into this work with um, uh, uh, a stock and flow diagram. And uh, so you can see how this intervention uh, changes uh, or makes a transition in the in the in the in the, um, in the society and in the city. Um, actually, we are have right now a work in progress about that. Um, and it's also about more related with the walks. Uh, because you know, with with these uh, walks, we we have mapped a lot of things, 
and these relationships that that we have found out we put it into this work right now like into this uh, um this map that we we developed uh, with Sally and and, and Lupita um, just to create a framework for for these interventions but actually uh, it is really important as you said like to look into this um bigger picture into one representation to to communicate uh, the, the the changes, um, but but in, in a way uh, this this also like the, the this work that we presented was part of this work in progress, uh, which has also been uh, really helpful uh, with uh, communicating with with different actors in the in the metropolitan area. Um, so yeah, uh, I think that, that it's a really accurate your your comment to put this into a really a general and more 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 um, holistic maybe representation. Um, and it's a working process that we are uh, having right now. So yes, thank you, Jonathan. Great, thanks. Uh, I guess Eva had a question or probably she wanted to just um, provide a feedback. Uh, I just wanted to add that from uh, my perspective of uh, working in uh, large project um, agile processes, um, adding to what uh, Inga said from the construction uh, industry perspective, um, uh, in 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 my perspective, even though agile is always in the loops and iterations is the agile thing. I feel that we are still uh, too limited in choices. And that is what we also really wanted to bring into the sort of uh, framework that uh, we have the, you have choices for your iterations and you, and you, you see how, what the project needs uh, and, uh, and can adjust um, all the time. So, um, we ask for um, practical examples. And I think since we are all professionals from different um, areas, um, we all have our perspectives on that. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> uh, just just a, a final, I don't know if uh, a final remark, I see we're running a bit out of time here, but I think one aspect that we didn't cover with your framework is this facilitation a satellite that kind of runs around the whole entire. And I think uh, maybe, uh, uh, I think it's an important kind of uh, uh, activity that goes on in these and in between these loops. Uh, and I would challenge you to maybe kind of unpack it a little bit more. And uh, and I see I saw that Esben illustrated how it can move around. So that was the second question I had, but I see that we are a bit uh, limited in terms of time. but. I'm super curious to hear more about the facilitation satellite, or it's kind of I interpret it as a satellite at the moment, the, the way I view it in the map. But uh, perhaps it's it's more than that. Uh, so I was curious to see whether what 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 does facilitation do in terms of these dynamics that the framework is trying to illustrate, in a sense, because I think it's a rather important element. But uh, perhaps I'm wrong. <laughs> I'll just add a comment in to say, let's have let's talk about that for a few minutes, but to also let people who were planning to release at 11, sure. please go. We'll see you uh, in one of the next weeks. And uh, thanks so much for joining. But let's just have a little after talk uh, for anyone who can stick around for a few minutes. Happy to. I'd really love to hear, hear some more comment on that. So thanks, everyone who's who's leaving us now. And uh, we'll see you soon. So Espen or Inge or Eva, does any of you have just a quick comment related to the aspect of facilitation as part of this uh, framework? Yes, please. Yeah, if I can just say something in general, um, I think uh, obviously there is somehow the need for facilitation in any process or any conversation that intends to step outside of the normal um, um, let's say expectations of practice. How this is done is maybe not so important, 
Um, but someone needs to be there. At least that has been my uh, experience in practice. That the that the position or the that the uh, participation of someone with a facilitating role, almost the, regardless of their expertise, provides a kind of triangulation point in the conversation that allows everybody to step outside of uh, uh, the normal um, kind of flow of things. Um, how that is done, I think Peter's comment that, that this uh, implementation is done differently in every local circumstance, and but so is facilitation. Mm -hmm. um, but for someone to be there and say, let's do something else, I think is as um uh, uh as important in um using something like this framework um and uh, uh and as everywhere else um yeah and we did also connect it a bit to the role so they change or sorry they um, shift between the roles in the team for example so in some certain context it's it's probably useful for someone who has a lot of connections who can act as boundary broker so to say to take take over the facilitation and say we have to talk to these people we have to include this perspective and we need to learn more about this for example in other contexts there could be designers taking over the facilitation so we did uh, think about facilitation in terms of roles and how they shift but I'm, i agree you know you should unpack it more to learn more about it um there, there is something more that would be to be learned. We also talked about having multiple facilitation uh, indications in, in the framework that got a bit complex. So the, I think in general, we have to learn more about the role of facilitation in terms of this, I agree. And there's also, if I can just add a very uh, important question when it comes to facilitation, does the facilitator need to have deep no domain knowledge or not? Uh, and that is, I think, open to discussion in, in every case. I, I talked to Harold Nelson on email a few weeks ago, and he said that system make designers has to be polymaths or something like that. They have to have knowledge in, in different areas uh, and put that together in, in their work. I'm not sure if you want anyone wants to comment on that, but uh, we, we thought also about having that sort of competence within a team and not just within a person. Uh, Facilitation is different. So I'd yep. say in, in, in dialogic design and in deliberation, and we talk about this a lot, that um, even if you do have uh, deep knowledge, it is inappropriate as the facilitator to introduce more than, say, provocations or questions that might draw that from the stakeholders who are, at least in the dialogic design approach, the facilitation is creating uh, you know, the, the space for the stakeholders to to be the designers for their own outcomes. And so I've I've played that role because I do have expertises in different areas. I've facilitated in and and it can come off really badly to to interject with what especially if you think that you've kind of got an answer and you've got real experts in the room. Um, and so there is a, a and that can also reduce the credibility of the sense of expected neutrality of the facilitator, especially in complex participate in complex um, facilitation where you have multi stakeholders maybe at very different levels of power or maybe in antagonistic relationships with each other, or may have been specifically selected to be from different aspects of, you know, of a, of a large, you know, say you're working with municipalities or you know any any type of a public sector you're going to have you know different perspectives in the room that also need to have need to be coordinated so there are different modes of facilitation that might be more prevalent at the beginning the middle and and the, you know or and in, in the implementation too and there might be different skills in facilitation something crystal van ale and i are trying to develop further in the design journeys approach and to just put some of our ideas in the short and kind of the shorter book about the different workshop types that that privilege a different more of a, a, a you know framing workshops in your proposition and reframing which are more open ended but facilitators in implementation have to be very good at creating convergence and decision making while being fair and um, uh, and and listening to the different perspectives that might be consequential in those in that in the, that 
convening or uh, deliberation. You know, so there are different terms in facilitation too that I think are helpful to consider because just if we think of it as system leadership, system convening, uh, coordination, uh, collaboration, co-design, co-creation, each of those has a different, somewhat different valence. And there may be different facilitation modes that are more in one of those than another. Yeah, and I think just to jump on to what you're saying, Peter, I think uh, maybe uh, one question you can ask yourselves is, so what does it mean to be a facilitator given that this is the framework you are navigating through? Yeah, and it could be different facilitators. So, uh, I mean, this is a huge, uh, I know I'm opening a huge uh, box here, uh, but I think it's it's worth mentioning or unpacking it a little bit more with this uh, framework as a background uh, to inform some of the facility, because then, then it might re actually really become useful, not only a phenomenological uh, depiction of the, of, the, of, the, of the phenomenon going on, but also how one can really navigate uh, around it in those different areas. So it might be that if you're finding yourself in a certain feedback loop, you would apply these kinds of, uh, I don't know, it's just, a, it's just something that I was inspired by looking at your, and then I just saw this tiny dot of facilitation and said, oh, I think there's quite a lot more to it, given that you kind of lay out this fantastic uh, holistic model, I think, uh, which is super interesting to, 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 to observe. So it's just a, a, an inspiration that opened up some questions for me, and I think maybe could be uh, something you can work further on, actually. Thank you. I guess Genji had to add something on it. Probably she had a, she had a reason. Yeah, I, I think that you guys are at this point already reading my mind. Uh, I just highlighted uh, uh, three different modes. Um, even within one facilitation, I observed myself going from highly informed uh, guide uh, to very naive um, kid asking all kinds of questions, poking the holes to really trying to provoke. And at that point, you're trying to pull out some creative vision for the organization to go after, uh, just really think outside of the box. So I think all the things that you guys mentioned, this like this, the role of facilitation is very important, especially in the beginning of the process, I call that front end innovation process, where you are trying to reimagine, reframe, rethink the business as usual or status quo, then even with the PhD titles in the room or scientist titles, they need to really reframe what they do every day. And we provide a new frame, then dismantling of the knowledge happens right there and then. So it's very dynamic and it's based on this very recursive conversation process. I find that fascinating. Angie, I'm interested that you say that happens sometimes in a single meeting, and it sounds like what you've described, and please correct me or, or clarify, but it, what you've described really sounds like the SODIF uh, framework, like the, mm -hmm. in our short demonstration of it, this sort of looping back, and I wondered if one of the SODIF folks wanted to just comment on that, because it's actually sometimes happening instantly, you know, um, you talk about sort of the there's kind of a filtering brain that's always happening. Actors talk about it as like something that's there, even though they're in the moment and we all have mm -hmm. it. And and I'm wondering, uh, I wondered, Espen, uh, two things about the SODIF model. One is like, do you see that happening instantly within say the facilitator's experience in the moment? And the other question I had uh, just quickly is whether you saw the framework being useful for research. Uh, for like a long-term research project as a framework that you're using? Good question. Uh, I think um, I would say yes for, for research, but I think we don't, we haven't probably reflected so much on that as opposed to the uh, experience that we have from doing implementation in our own work contexts. But uh, yes, I would think that it is something that you can bring up also in terms of research. Um, 
and uh, and, and reflect on that also, in, especially over time uh, and as uh, things uh, happen and, and come back as a, as a tool there also. But I think we have to perhaps also take on that lens a bit and, and see if there's any different phenomena, phenomenon coming in then if you're looking into long-term research um, as opposed to working with the more short-term projects, for example. And uh, could you just uh, quickly take the first question again? I, I lost uh, the beginning mm. of it. I'm, I'm just thinking that the actual framework uh, looks like kind of a mapping of a brain, could be a mapping of sort of the brain process, the left to right brain oh, yeah. interaction yeah. happening happening in kind of the white matter in like instantaneous moments mm -hmm. as opposed to over an extended period. And so when Angie was talking about that, maybe happening within a single mm, session, happening. That you've got this, about it in two years this activity early, but... happening. Yeah, I think uh, we uh, discussed a lot about mm. what implementation means for us and, and how we used it, and in terms of projects or, uh, on shorter and longer uh, periods of time, but also in terms of workshop contexts. And I, I think you're right, the how fast things move in here is also in, uh, related to the context of, of where you're applying this framework. And so if it's in a workshop, things move fast, for example, and um, and maybe in a, in a project it's it's uh, slower. It could be over several workshops or meetings or in between uh, with stakeholders. So I think it's we found this to be related to the context of use, so to say, in terms of how how and what you are doing in terms of implementation, how fast you move uh, and how you do facilitation also. Um, because this facilitation in a big project with multiple stakeholders is quite different from in a workshop with 10 people, for example. Um, probably not a very clear answer, but uh, some of the reflections that we had at least. Well, thank you for that. I'm just going to note we're 15 minutes after. We People are, are not leaving, which is <laughs> great. So there's obviously interest in the conversation, but perhaps we should. Um, start to wrap up Akash and unless anyone has any last oh I see Francis Francis has hand up maybe Francis last comment and then we'll we'll wrap this session yeah so uh, I just I just wanted to jump in because um and I just posted a comment to Ingrid's uh chat so I'll be brief um I think the entire notion of uh, the entire topic of facilitation and how it should how it plays out at the systemic level where there are multiple organizations where inter-organizational facilitation is needed uh, governance to enable that that's a huge topic we tried to touch a bit on it in our uh, rsd 12 paper on what we think is system systemic uh, facility or systems level facilitation uh, and one observation is that you need multiple skills uh, you don't need to be engaged. You cannot interfere with the uh, uh, discussion, but you uh, provoke and prod and elicit uh, answers. But when you do that with multiple organizations, with multiple cultures, uh, multiple organizational styles, it it offers uh, some uh, interesting challenges. Uh, so sy system level facilitation is definitely something to be looked at because organization level facilitation and organization level uh, interaction with suppliers and partners has been around for some time. I feel inter-organizational facilitation where equals participate in so-called ecosystemic relationships, that is under research. So that was just a comment. Cash, any final closing comments? Um, I have a couple. Maybe I'll just do mine. And then I just wanted to thank everyone. Um, I know so many names here. If anyone wants to turn their camera on to wave goodbye, it's always lovely to put a face to a name.